it's always interesting to think of a topic that's going to be interesting for a physiotherapist, for a financial advisor, for a solicitor, for a home care worker, for an architect, for all of the above. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. Hey, come on, come on, yeah. Now, without um, any going on any further, I'm really, really proud to introduce the next our next speaker, Jane Turner uh, from Amazing Aging. Uh, we'll tell you a bit more about herself in a second, but she is the principal uh, senior clinical psychologist with a with a love and a passion for aging, which is why she calls it Amazing Aging. Anyway, without going on any further, introducing Jane. Jane Turner. Thanks, Louise. Hello, everyone. Thanks for uh, being here today. Um, it's really great to see uh, the passion and commitment around the room and hear all your stories. So um, I turned 60 earlier this year, and I had a big party to celebrate, squeezed in between the bushfires, the floods, and COVID-19. <laughs> and um, I've been working in the field of ageing for the last 25 years. Um, and there have been two psychological phenomena that I've witnessed repeatedly with my clients in this time. And I'll give you a, a little example of a real case, and then I'll discuss them. So Fred was a 95-year-old man who was recently admitted to a nursing home. He was referred to me because he had expressed suicidal ideation. Specifically, um, he threatened to swallow his hearing aid batteries if he wasn't allowed to go home again. Um, so I did the assessment and towards the end I asked him, what is it about this place that you really don't like? And he looked at me with shock and with all seriousness he said, have you looked around here? They're all old people. <laughs> and I said, then asked him, um, how, old, how old are you? And he said, 95, but I don't feel my age. So I just think that this example really captures these two related phenomena that I've pondered for many years. And these are firstly, I don't feel my age, which is called subjective age versus chronological age. And secondly, I'm not like the others here. That is, I don't identify with this older group of people. So it may or may not come as a surprise to you that both of these are the product of ageism in our society. First, we internalise the negative stereotype of old age, and then we go all out to distance ourselves from it. So the prospect of being old or being like others who are old is so abhorrent to us that we master ways to try and avoid it. And the research literature calls this age group dissociation. Interestingly, the research recently has found that during this COVID-19 pandemic, people have felt younger than their chronological age. So this supports the hypothesis that subjective age partly reflects a coping process of psychological distancing from older age, the very age group that are most vulnerable to COVID-19. So psychologist Eric Erickson argued that the Western fear of ageing keeps us from living full lives. So lacking a culturally viable ideal of old age, he said, our civilization does not really harbor a concept of the whole of life. So what is ageism? Well, the World Health Organization defines it as um, the stereotyping, prejudice, and discrimination against people on the basis of their age. Ageism is widespread and an insidious practice and with harmful effects on the health and well-being of older adults. So for older people, ageism is an everyday challenge. We just have to look at who's had trouble finding a job after age 50. So discrimination occurs in a variety of settings, and from our experience, we know this is particularly evident in the workplace and in healthcare. And there are also increasing concerns about the extent of elder abuse in the Australian community both in institutional and family settings. So ageism is everywhere, yet it's most socially, the most socially normalised of any prejudice and is not widely counted like racism or sexism is. 
So according to social representation theory, the views of ageing held within a given culture are a form of shared cultural representation. They constitute systems of ideas, values and customs related to ageing that are treated by members of that society as if they were established reality. So I would argue that the end result of this systemic ageism in our society has led to the parlous state of our aged care system, especially residential aged care. And this state of affairs is currently under review by the Royal Commission. The privatisation of service delivery and the commodification of care within a poorly regulated capitalist and ageist system results in mass neglect and premature death of older people. The COVID-19 pandemic has shone a spotlight on our vulnerable older population and failing aged care system, with the over 70s making up 93% of all COVID-19 deaths in Australia. And of the over 70s that have died, 94% were in residential aged care. So for older people still living at home, the pandemic has meant they've become more socially isolated, they can no longer attend their usual social activities, and for older people in residential aged care, the impact has been dire. They've lost access to group activities, volunteer visitors, family visitors during the lockdown. And this has led to an increase in their mental health problems that we're seeing, particularly in depression and behavioural disturbance. So ageism develops from our cultural and society values, as we've said. For us, this means in the context of capitalism. As discussed, we all internalise these cultural and societal values. So how do we know ageism is driven by society and culture? Well, historically, older people were valued and respected members of society across cultures for their vast knowledge of the culture. And scholars have noted a contemporary shift toward a general devaluing of older people in modern societies, especially in westernised societies and cultures. So there are cross-cultural differences in ageing perceptions and different cultures have different attitudes and practices around ageing and death. And these cultural perspectives can have a huge impact on how we ourselves experience ageing. So we just need to look at different traditional cultures where the value and treatment of older people differs from our own. For example, firstly the Chimani people, of, um, they're an Amazonian indigenous tribe who live in the lowland regions of Bolivia. Research has revealed that these Chimani people reported more positive ageing perceptions than two other westernised societies, um, especially with regard to their memory functioning. And secondly, the Asian cultures of Korea, China and Japan, where the principle of Confucian filial piety, a fundamental value, um, dictates that one must respect one's parents and the elders in society. Um, it's customary in Korea to have a big celebration to mark an individual's 60th or 70th birthdays. And interestingly, Japan has a much lower proportion of deaths for their over 70s as compared to Australia. So finally, how can we tackle ageism and improve the lives of old, older people? Well, tackling ageism during this pandemic requires finding the evidence that contravenes the negative stereotypes. We can look for examples that value both the wisdom and personal resilience that come with old age. And leaders who are older are often deemed wise. For example, the USA's most respected voice in response to the COVID-19 pandemic comes from Dr Anthony Fauci, who himself is 79 years old. Secondly, research has found that education regarding ageing and positive contact experiences with older people have been successful in changing negative attitudes. These interventions can include intergenerational experiences with older people and older people themselves providing education about old age to younger people. For example, as seen in the ABC production, Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds. Don't know if you watched that last year. Um, that's a good example of this intervention. And research has found that greater accurate knowledge of ageing is associated with more positive attitudes towards older people. 
Then thirdly, we need to increase the usefulness for older people themselves. So, how can we help them feel useful, find purpose and meaning again after retirement? Particularly for men who often don't have anything after they retire. So, being useful creates value. And roles such as childminding often achieve this. We need to emphasise the things that older people can do better than younger people. So finding roles such as teaching, advising, supervising, whether these might be voluntary or paid roles. Um, and we can encourage older people to contribute their unique experiences of having lived through the Great Depression and either one or two world wars and other wars. They've shown remarkable resilience that we could all learn and benefit from. And finally, under COVID-19 conditions, tackling ageism is much more difficult as our older people often struggle to both access and use digital resources that um, have become necessary. Finally, um, to quote the chief editor of the Gerontologist Journal, he states, drawing upon the experience and resources across the lifespan will build resilience against despair. Our obligations are to steadfastly tackle ageism in all its forms and to offer hope, compassion and empathy to those for whom we are responsible. Thank you. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. Hey, come on, come on, yeah.